Well, we've been working our way rather slowly through the first epistle of the Apostle John. And uh, last two times I spoke, uh, Zach spoke last week, and I appreciate that so much. But the last two, two times I spoke, we were looking at these first verses at the beginning of chapter 2, focusing on Christ as our advocate and Christ as our propitiation. On the one hand, Christ defends us in the courtroom when we've broken God's law. On the other hand, Christ turns away the wrath of God from us and turns that wrath into favor. But we come now to a new paragraph starting in verse 3 of 1 John chapter 2. So if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles, we'll, we'll just read that first. And there it is. Put that up on the screen. Um, By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word, in Him the love of God has been truly perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says He abides in Him ought Himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So verse 3 says, By this we know that we have come to know him. Uh, Verse 5 says, By this we know that we are in him. And using this language, the apostle is introducing one of the great themes of this whole book of 1 John. The great topic of assurance. Assurance. Assurance means being sure about something. Uh, In this case, uh, the Apostle is talking about being sure about our salvation. Sure that we really are, as as he puts it, we really have come to know the Lord. We really are in Christ. We really are abiding in Christ. The Apostle wants every person to whom he is writing to be certain that they are saved, that they are a real, authentic Christian. And, and really, when you think about it, there's no bigger question in the world than this, is there? This question of, am I saved? Am I right with God? Is the blood of Jesus washed away my sins or not? Is Christ really my advocate? Is Christ really my propitiation? Can I take those promises for myself? Am I on the narrow way that leads to heaven or on the broad way that leads to hell? It's a big question. A troubling question. Am I under God's smile or still under His wrath? It's pretty common for Christians to go through seasons in their lives where they are troubled by these questions. Questions of assurance. Questions of wondering, am I really saved or not? Could be some in the room are are feeling those questions today. And and maybe that's happened to you in the past. It's really hard, if you lack assurance, it is hard to be a joyful, fruitful Christian. I mean, it's hard to even read your Bible. You read these wonderful promises and you think, well, this is a great promise, but is it really for me? I don't know if if I'm not sure that I'm saved. And so it's essential, it's a big deal to be sure that we are a Christian. And, there's, and, and I think we can say with confidence that God wants every believer to have assurance. He wants you to be sure. And I think that because of some Bible verses. How about this? Hebrews 10 verse 22 says, Let us draw near meaning draw near to God, draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. It sounds like you're sure that you're drawing near to God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 says, says, Therefore, brethren, he's talking to brethren, says, Brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about His calling and choosing you. Be diligent. Really, Work at this. Don't quit until you're certain that, that, you, that you belong to the Lord. Paul exhorts the Corinthian church 
In 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 13, verse 5, he says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? So there's a real problem. A lack of assurance can be a real problem. But there's another assurance problem that's kind of on the opposite side. And that is the problem of false assurance. That's when somebody is absolutely sure that they're saved, when they're actually not saved at all. That's a problem, isn't it? Um, I suspect that there are millions of people sitting right now in American churches. Absolutely, they would say, yes, I'm saved. I'm confident I'm saved. But they're actually lost. And that's a big issue. And it's an issue that the Bible warns us about. The danger of self-deception. The danger of a false assurance. You know there in, in, in Matthew 7, Jesus Jesus. Talking about the judgment day, he says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not uh, prophesy in your name, cast out uh, demons in your name, and your name perform many miracles? And I'll say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you practice lawlessness. Paul warns in Titus 1 about, about people who profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him. Like they say the right thing, but their life is a mess. Again, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, he's talking about those who, who hold to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. They have a form of godliness. They, they, they look like a Christian from a distance, but there's no power there. There's no reality under the surface. We have these real life examples in the Bible, guys like Judas Iscariot or Simon the Sorcerer or, or Paul's buddy named Demas. And these, these folks all had the outward trappings of Christianity. They said they were saved. Everybody thought they were Christians for a while, but, but over time it, it somehow became clear that they were not actually Christians. That there was no inner reality in the whole thing. And so that can be a problem too. You can have a real Christian that lacks assurance, that needs to get it, and a, and a, and a non-Christian that has assurance that should not have assurance. Both problems. And the good news is that there's no place in the Bible that is more helpful for sorting out these issues of assurance than what we've got right here in the book of First John. It's like John, this old apostle, is like, is like a wise old pastor. And he understands what a big issue assurance is. And, and he's writing this letter to try to help with this. And he sort of sums things up near the end in this verse. 1 John 5, verse 13. He says, These things I have written to you who believe... In the name of the Son of God. He's writing to those believers. He says, I'm writing to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. Because I want you to know this for sure. Say, I know I have eternal life. Not just say, well, I hope I'm saved. I think it's pretty likely that I'm saved. I think the odds are pretty good that I'm going to heaven. He says, no, I want you to know it. To know that you have eternal life right now this is your possession this is real for you the apostle was not content for anybody to be left saying something less than i know i have eternal life that's what he would want every one of us to be able to say i know that i have eternal life that's what i want for each one of us here to have that confidence and certainty based on the Word of God. It is great joy. It is a glorious thing to have that certainty. Say, yes, I'm confident that I'm really saved. I'm really going to heaven. So realizing that, that the Apostle's goal, one of his big goals in writing this letter, is, is to address these assurance issues. It is fascinating to observe how he goes about the task. 
You know, if you were going to write somebody a letter that was mainly about having assurance of salvation, what would you put in the letter? You know? And so, so it's interesting to, to see what John talks about and what he does not talk about. So I want to point out a few, uh, just a couple of things John does not talk about that you kind of expect him to say because it's things we sometimes say and maybe we shouldn't say it. For example, John does not give any blanket reassurances. John does not just say, he does not say, oh, you guys don't need to worry about assurance. Of course you're all saved. Don't give it another thought. John doesn't talk that way, does he? Instead, he sort of does the opposite. He sort of says some really pointed, searching things. To be things that kind of make us uncomfortable when we read them. It's no just blankets of, of comfort. It's, it's the opposite. You know, when you're, when you're going through a time of struggling with assurance questions, it's natural to want somebody somebody else to kind of reassure us and help us out. And, you know, we, we kind of want our mom or our best friend or maybe our pastor to come along, put their arm around us and say, hey, hey, buddy, you don't need to worry about this. Of course you're saved. But friends, we can't do that. We can't give assurance to somebody else. I mean, we, did, we ultimately do not really know anybody else in an exhaustive way. Now we know some people well. You know, we know people right in our immediate families pretty well. Uh, but, but still, we're just looking on from the outside. We're looking at somebody's life. We see little glimpses of, well, here's some good fruit over here. Here's some kind of bad fruit over here. And we're trying to kind of sort things out. But, but we do not see the heartbeat of somebody's relationship with the Lord, do we? We don't see what's really going on there. Sometimes we get really surprised. Down the road, you say, well, I thought I really knew that guy. And maybe, maybe he wasn't even saved or you know, whatever. No, ultimately, your assurance is not something somebody else can give you. It's a matter between you and God. You have to work this out with the Lord. We can't reassure somebody else. Something, something else that John does not do in his letter is he does not push, point people back to their conversion story. Um, we sometimes do that for folks, but, but that's, that seems dangerous. See, if, if the foundation of your assurance is some story, you know, 17 years ago you raised your hand at a VBS meeting. Or you, you know, some preacher sat down with you and you prayed the prayer together and you cried a few tears and you felt a tingly feeling. I mean, if your assurance comes down to memories of a story from the ancient past, then that's not a biblical assurance. You've got to have more than that. See, um, now our conversion stories, they're very precious to us. We, we enjoy sharing those, sharing what the Lord has done in our lives. That's great to do that. But, but the Bible does not point that back, point us back to those stories as the reason why we know that we are saved. Uh, in fact, we have people in the Bible like that Simon the Sorcerer guy in Acts 8 that I mentioned a minute ago. I mean, he had a, a whiz-bang, exciting conversion story. And then, and then you read down the verses a little ways and you find out, well, the guy wasn't even saved at all, it seems like. Um, well, furthermore, John does not point anybody back to their baptism. I mentioned going to baptism service yesterday. We believe baptism is important. Christ said to get baptized. But it's not baptism that gives us assurance. And you might think this is a strange thing to say, but, 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 but I guarantee you, if you're witnessing to people out there, you will run across this different times. You ask somebody, you know, why do you think you're going to heaven? Why do you think you're saved? And the answer comes back, well, because I was baptized. And it's some story about their baptism, the water baptism. Well, no, that's, that's not what John's talking about here. And, and it's not just the experience of conversion and baptism, but, but John doesn't point back to any like exciting spiritual experiences as a reason to have assurance of salvation. Uh, I mean, some folks you, you'll run into, they rest their assurance on the fact that they, you know, maybe they spoke in tongues. Before they they demonstrated it, you know, a particular spiritual gift at some point in time. They think, well, I must be saved because this experience happened to me. Maybe I had this mystical experience of God. You know, I, God just filled the room, and you knew God was there. Well, great, but that's not 
a ground for a biblical assurance. You see, it would be wonderful to have an experience like the Apostle Paul and get caught up to the third heavens, right? We'd all love to have that happen. But you know, if that happened to me, and I came back to you, I, that would still not be the that would still not be the ground for my assurance as a Christian. The fact that I had seen some amazing vision of heaven or something. Because we know that the devil can counterfeit experiences all the time for folks. In fact, when testing people's assurance here in 1 John, the apostle puts the emphasis not on the past, but on the present. And that's, a, that's an important principle. Not on the past, but on the present. How are things right now between you and the Lord? How have things been going in your soul recently? Um, I mean, if, if things have been bad, if things have been bad for the last you know, year or two, it's not much comfort to say, well, things were better ten years ago or something, something like that. Not much comfort. I mean, it could be your foundation was bad ten years ago and it's just now being exposed today as having been a trouble. So that's just some, some comments, some stuff that John does not mention with regard to our assurance. Uh, but of course, we want to focus on what he does actually talk about here. Um, how can we conclusively diagnose our spiritual condition? How can we be sure that we have eternal Life. What, what does John point to? Well, well, over the rest of John's letter, he sets forth a series of tests that we can administer to ourselves. Tests. And these, these tests fall into, into these three big categories. What I call the test of obedience, the test of love, and the test of truth. And... Uh, uh, obedience is, is whether we're obeying God's commands and imitating Jesus. Uh, the test of love is whether we're loving people, and especially loving the brethren. And then truth is whether we believe right doctrine about Jesus Christ. And this, this structure, I, I assure you, is not original with me. A bunch of the commentaries uh, pointed at this out. Uh, they, they sometimes call it by different names. I think Stott's commentary he calls it the, uh, the moral test, the social test, and the doctrine test. But pretty much the same idea. Um, one thing to notice here is all these verse references underneath the outlines. Um, John doesn't just give any of these tests once. He keeps coming back to it again and again. He keeps, you know, we talked before, the structure of 1 John is kind of loops, kind of a spiral. Um, and, so, and so all three tests are stated in chapter 2, but then they're each stated again in a more detailed way uh, from chapter 2, verse 28, to chapter 4, verse 6. And then John hits them again a third time in sort of an interconnected way in, in from 4 7 through chapter 5 verse 5 and and as we as we move along through the through the book Lord willing we'll be we'll be talking about these different verses in detail kind of as we get to them but for today I want us to just see the big picture here and 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 I want to spend some time just reading these verses and I want us to be able to hear the repetition but also hear the variation that John uses a little different words each, each time he talks about this stuff. He's, he's making the same big point, but he's saying it different ways. It's like he's hitting it from different angles, saying it in a little different language. Sometimes he says it positively, sometimes he says it negatively, and so on. So, so you pay attention to that, you'll see what I mean. So we'll begin with the test of obedience. And of course the first example is the one we already read here from from verses 3 through 6. But I'll read it again. He says, By this we know we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. The one who says I've come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. The truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word in Him, the love of God 
has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And, uh, and we'll, just, we'll just go forward uh, and read these verses. You can follow along in your old Bible if you'd like. Uh, so, so then in chapter 2, verse 29, he says, You know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Then, then in chapter 3, verse 3, he says, Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. And then probably the, the strongest passage is in chapter 3, beginning at verse 6. It says, No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or known him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him. He cannot sin because he's born of God. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. And then further down, uh, chapter 3, verse 24, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. Uh, chapter 3, verse or chapter 5, verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So did you notice the repetition there? Did you notice that these verses are all saying pretty similar thing? Just saying, we need to obey God. We need to walk in, in conformity uh, with God's commandments. He, and he, so he uses that term. He talks about practicing righteousness, purifying ourselves, not sinning, imitating Christ's example. Um, and so it raises this one basic question. Am I walking in obedience with the Lord? Is the pattern of my life one of sincerely, carefully, eagerly striving to do whatever God's Word tells me to do. Of course, nobody does it perfectly. We talked a lot about that a few weeks ago, you know. Uh, but, but the question is, well, what's the overall picture? What's the overall picture of my life? In the nitty-gritty of my everyday lifestyle choices, is the Lord Jesus my role model? Is the Lord Jesus my shepherd? Is the Lord Jesus my king? Is he the one that I'm, that I'm trying to serve the best I can? Um, and not doing it legalistically with gritted teeth, you know. But, but it's because he, his law is written on our hearts because he, we want to obey him. We want to please him as much as we can. So that's the first test, the test of obedience. And hopefully that's, that's clear enough. The second is the test of love. And specifically it's love for the brethren is what all these verses talk about. So, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to, I'm just going to read, read the verses and, and you can follow along or just listen. And, and again, hear the, hear the repetition but also the variation. Um, so 1 John 2 in verse 9, it says, The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Then chapter 3, verse 11, For this is the message which we've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Then in chapter 3, verse 14, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. And then chapter 4, verse 7. 
says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And then skip to verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. And then chapter 4, verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And the commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. 1 John 5 and verse 1 is the last reference for this one, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. So all these verses are about loving people, but not people in general. Specifically, he's, he's focusing in on Christians, on the brethren. The, the, the children of God, the one another's. That's his language. And the kind of love John is talking about is obviously not just kind of a superficial thing. It's not an easy thing. It's not just saying a few nice words to somebody. He's talking about laying down our lives for the brethren. Right? He's saying, don't just love in words. He's saying, do it in deed and truth. Do sacrificial things. Go out of your way, not closing your heart, but doing, doing actions that prove our love. All through the New Testament, Christians are described as our brothers and sisters. We're used to that language. And, and because we're used to it, I think we, look, we, we don't see the bigness of that language. He's, he's saying these Christians are your family. Not just some people you hang around with once or twice a week, but they're they're. You have a committed love relationship with the saints. Your brothers and sisters. They're your family in a more real way than our natural siblings are. And so that's the test. Do you love these Christians? Not just a few of your favorite people or your friends, but, but everybody. Everybody here. Are they precious to you? You care about their welfare. You want to be with them. You want to see them flourish. So you go out of your way to encourage and serve them. So that's a test of love. And again, we'll talk more about it down the road, Lord willing. But then thirdly, we have this test of truth. Truth about Christ. And so I'll read, I'll read these, these verses to you as well. So, so in, in chapter 2, verse 22... It says, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, and the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father And then chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they were from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that It is coming and now it is already in the world. Chapter 4, verse 15 says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Chapter 5, verse 1, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Chapter 5, verse 5, Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So that's the third test. It's believing and confessing biblical truth about Jesus Christ. 
You don't need to have perfect theology to be saved. <laughs> Thank God for that. I suspect none of us do have perfect theology. Um, we can be ignorant about many things. We can be wrong about various details. But you must embrace the biggest truths about the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be a Christian. See, our whole faith rests on Him. It's on the person of Christ. And so we better have our faith in the right person. The real Jesus. You know, the Apostle Paul warned in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, he, says if, about, he warns about someone coming to you and preaching another Jesus. Another Jesus whom we have not preached. He says, watch out. If, you, if you've got this other Jesus over here that's not the one that the apostles taught in the Bible, some other version of Jesus. That's not, that, that guy can't save you. It's only the Jesus of the Bible that can save you. And so your faith must be in the right Jesus, in a biblical Jesus. And so if you deny big truths about, about Him, and deny His deity, deny His humanity, deny His sinlessness, deny His truthfulness, Deny His atonement. Deny His resurrection. Deny His future return. I'm not sure what all we should put on the list, but, but big truths about Christ. If you deny those truths, then you can't be a Christian. Which is point. And it does not matter how nice or how spiritual you are. Many of the cults are filled with nice people. <laughs> Spiritual people, you know. People nicer than me. We're not saved by our niceness or our spiritualness. We're saved by Jesus. And so if they deny the biggest truths about Jesus, we've got to say they're not Christian. John would say that they're not Christian. The Word of God says that. And so what we believe about Jesus is super important. So my goal for today was just to give an introduction to this, this theme of assurance and how it works out uh, through this uh, letter of First John and, and to highlight these three great tests of assurance that we will encounter repeatedly as we work our way through the book. I want you to see kind of the big picture of the whole thing and, and to see the three things together instead of just kind of hitting one at a time. Um, but before I close today, I, it seems like an appropriate time for, for just a general word of caution about this whole subject of, of testing the genuineness of our salvation. Um, because because I, in my experience, and, and I, I don't know that I've got Bible verses for all this, I'm just speaking out of my experience as a pastor. My, in my experience... Um, these matters can be misunderstood and misapplied by people in, 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 the, way they, in the way they think about it. And, and it can actually turn into something harmful. So I don't want anybody to get, get off track here. One danger is reversing the order of cause and effect. Reversing the order of cause and effect. Let me explain that. You see, you can turn these tests into kind of a system of salvation by works. Okay, you can look at this list and say, "Well, Christians uh, do the obedience thing, and they do the love thing, and they do the truth thing, and so, so I just need to go do those things, and then I'll be a Christian. And if I keep on doing those things, then I'll keep myself a Christian over time." No, no. If you're thinking that way, you've just got it all the way backwards. We are saved entirely by grace. We're saved entirely, 100% by the work of the Lord Jesus. We do not save ourselves and we do not keep ourselves saved by doing enough of this stuff. That's trouble. That's getting things in the wrong wrong order. No, these, these things are not a cause of your salvation. They're a result of you having already been saved by God's grace. The, these things are evidence that the Holy Spirit has already been working 
in your life. He's already changed you. He's already made you into a new creature in Christ. And so these are some of the things that new creatures do. And and that we can see in ourselves when the Holy Spirit has been working. So make sure you don't get things in the wrong order. You'll be in trouble. Another mistake we can make is, is failing to see the big picture of our lives. Failing to see the big picture. So, so you have this kind of scenario. You have, you have a believer that's just going through a rough patch in their Christian life. We all do. Uh, you, you're going through a time, you maybe have had a couple of months, whatever, where your soul just feels dry. And the Lord doesn't feel close like He usually does. You, you read the Bible, you're not enjoying the Bible like you usually enjoy the Bible. It's hard going. And, you know, maybe, maybe you're struggling with some particular sin over here that's just, you feel like you're being defeated in this. And, and, and you know, and so the, these doubts just kind of start creeping in and, and you're just generally discouraged. And, and then, then in your Bible reading, you come to 1 John. And so you read through 1 John, you get to the end of 1 John, and you're thinking, man, maybe I'm not even saved at all. You know, I've got these different problems going on. I feel kind of dry. Maybe I'm just lost. You know, maybe that's the conclusion. Well, it's possible. It's possible that that's what's going on. But it's also possible, and I think more likely, that, that you're just focusing on these particular difficulties, these shortcomings that are right in front of your mind right now. And you're not seeing the bigger picture of how much grace there is in your life, how much progress is being made, maybe in other areas. There's a lot of growth going on. And so there's always things that are bothering us, you know, something that's not right, that's, you know, out of whack a little bit. But, but these tests are a big picture view. You know, it's, it's more the 10,000 foot view of your life. What does is, what is the overall picture look like? Is there really life there? Is there divine grace at work? Are you a new creature at all? And then let, one more caution. Let me suggest that it is possible to think about these three tests too much. It's possible to think about this too much. Of course, there's people that don't think about it enough. But on the other hand... For whatever reason, there, there are a, a, a number of Christians, I think a pretty small number, who, who, who are attracted to a diet of, of like hard-hitting preaching um, from, you know, say, say guys like, like, like Leonard Ravenhill in the previous generation or Paul Washer today, you know, where, where, where the preacher is often forcefully challenging your salvation. That kind of preaching can be good. It can be biblical. We just read a bunch of Bible verses about it. But I, I would also say that a little bit of it can go a long way. And we should periodically examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. That's what we're talking about today. Today would be a good day to examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. But it's not something we should be thinking about continually. Not every day. Not even every week, I suspect. Most of our spiritual attention should not be directed at ourselves at all. Most of our spiritual attention should not be inward. It should be going outward. We should be looking to the Lord. We should be looking to our salvation in Christ. That's where the help, that's where the encouragement comes from. Do you remember that old Robert Murray McShane quote where he says, for every one look at yourself, you should take ten looks at the Lord Jesus. There's wisdom in that, right? And so, so we can't, it is possible to become too introspective with these things and just kind of get yourself tied in knots. In that case, the, the antidote is, is fix your eyes upon Jesus. You look full in His wonderful face. And, and that's where we're going to find our help. When we look at ourselves all the time, we're going to see shortcomings. Guaranteed. There's going to be trouble in us. There's going to be things that, that bother us. But our gaze most of the time needs to be on Christ our salvation.
I look forward to to talking about some of these things in more detail as we work through the book of First John. And I've been in my prayer has been that the Lord would really use it in our lives. You know, the Lord would use it um, if if there are people with assurance problems. You know, we talked about well, you can have a lack of assurance, or you can have a false assurance. If there's anybody here in one of those two categories. That, that you know, we ought to really hope and expect and pray that, that by studying God's Word together that He'll help us. He'll help us in those things. And that there could be real breakthroughs in our lives through the Word of God. And so that's been my prayer um, as, we, as we look ahead to our future studies. Amen.